detailed discussion. But what I'm trying to do is provide the context because this is a detector that's going to be a primary detector in the future. And you'll, you'll see what I mean by it. And I wanted to emphasize a small point, which uh, you'll understand later as, uh, as something that you automatically have been assuming when you do astronomical observations. You assume you can understand something about the physical conditions uh, where the light was being generated. So almost of all astronomy, that is, almost all astronomy is based on looking at the subtleties of the light from astronomical sources. Now we also have gravity waves, but not so many of them. It's a limited number uh, of, of objects that we observe. And uh, trying to infer what we can. And almost all of that is done by either imaging or spectroscopy and everything else you interpret in between. There is a lot more information that's being carried, although we may be getting the right answers anyway, but it's a little hard to see. So my claim is that quantum optics appears to have the potential of providing additional information uh, channel about the universe that lets us validate some of these things. So that's some of the point. But I have to provide you a little context, a little bit of information about what's going on. So let me talk about the trends. For many decades now, we've been improving detector sensitivity by cooling them. And that was just to overcome the thermal noise. And in fact, if you look, that's true not only for photons, but it's true also for gravity waves. When you'll see with Kagra, the mirror is cooled. The next generation of LIGO and, and Virgo, the mirrors will get, cold, get, get cooled and so forth. And it's to get rid of some of the thermal noise. So thermal noise was discovered about 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago, by Johnson. And he described this to Harry Nyquist, who was also working at Bell Labs at the time. And that, Bell, that, that Nyquist was able, in his study of analysis, to write down a formula for the, the variance in the voltage, or the, the, the RMS voltage, which you're used to, you've seen in the form of it being the square root of 4 kT uh, times the resistance. But in fact, the more general formula, which he wrote, which is true, it is the power spectrum of the noise at frequency f, uh, of the voltage noise at frequency f, is 4 k uh, times the Bolt 4 times the Boltzmann constant, times the temperature, times a function eta, which depends on the quantum aspects of it, times the real part of, of the impedance of the system. So you use the real part of impedance as the resistance, right? is what we call the resistance. And NF, the A to F, is usually equal to one, except if you go to very high frequencies or to very low temperatures. Now what we're talking about is we're going to low temperatures, so these factors begin to become important for some of these detectors. And so A to F is essentially the, the the Bose-Einstein factor plus an extra factor, uh, which is a derivative, right? The, it's the, the first part of the derivative that counts how many photons, uh, how many photons or how many quantum state there are. So what is going on is very simple. The electronic noise is generated by the thermal agitation of the charge carriers. That is, the, 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 the electrons generally, or whatever charge carrier, are are moving around because of thermal noise, and that creates a statistical current. And that statistical current ends up producing what we call the Johnson noise or the Nyquist noise, or Johnson Nyquist noise. And it, it happens in anything that's an electrical or semi electrical conductor uh, that's at thermal equilibrium, and regardless of what voltage you apply to it. So it turns out to be a fundamental limitation to, to the circuits. And that is the primary reason the fact that. The power or is proportional to the temperature, or the, the variance is proportional to the temperature to get very low temperatures, is the reason you cool detectors in order to get that thermal noise down. In the case of, of uh, LIGO Virgo, you're trying to get the thermal noise in the mirror down so it's not oscillating so much, but it's a similar kind of phenomenon. Okay, so a new device was discovered 100 and, what is this, 20 some, no, 140 years ago by an American astronomer called Samuel P. Port Langley. He invented the bolometer, which was very simple. You have a device, which is a very bad resistor to electrical engineers. That is, there's a high temperature coefficient of resistance, and you shine power on it, and you measure the change in resistance. 
and you have to heat, put it into a heat sink. There's a lot of extra things that go on. So this has been the standard by which power has been measured, that is the, the intensity, for a very long time. And the current state of the art of this, and I'll talk about them a little bit more to compare them, are the transition edge uh, sensors with electrothermal feedback. And they make use of the very steep electrical resistance versus temperature for the transition between normal conducting and superconducting. It's not an exact straight line. It's an actual very steep line. And by setting yourself on a particular place on that line and do electrofeedback to keep at that place, you can measure how much power it's being met because it's the sum of the power absorbed and the sum of the power you're putting into it. So the difference is now we're beginning to make devices in a well-defined quantum state that interact with individual photons. And when it, intera when it interacts, it absorbs the photon completely and goes into a new state. That measuring the change in the quantum numbers of that state tells you about the quantum numbers of the photon that was absorbed. So it's the transition from where you're going to just cooling things to get the thermal noise down to where you're trying to prepare them in a fixed quantum state and then absorb a photon or do something particularly with a photon or whatever it is and see what the quantum numbers of that photon were. And you can design them to look at one particular quantum number or several uh, things you're doing. And you will recognize this is extremely important for quantum computing and for quantum information uh, circuits. That these doing, in order to do quantum computing or to do quantum information exchange, you have to provide, you have to put things in a particular quantum state and have them interact with circuits or other things and then see the change in the quantum state. And so I'll talk about those briefly, but we'll, we'll see. You, you can ask me lots of questions, but I don't know how many of them I can answer. <laughs> the, the Johnson noise. So that, that formula assumes, uh, uh, assumes a linear device. Yes. It, it, well, it doesn't assume it's completely, it could be frequency dependent, but it's assuming that it's, that it's a device in thermal equilibrium and you're looking at a small variation. You're just looking at the, the things of behavior. Now, you can make semiconductor devices that are, that are one-sided and you know, like diodes and so forth, and it gets a little more complicated, but Most essentially the same. Useful right? semiconductor devices. Are, they're going to they're going to see this. It sort of doesn't apply, or no, no, it does apply to them, and it's worse. <laughs> you get screwed too because you get one of rough noise from the other the the, the bias things, and so it's just it's just like the Joseph's junction. You get tunneling of the charge carrier through those through the things that make you nonlinear, you, you actually get extra noise, but usually they're made. So, you know, people have been making semiconductor devices for a long time, and they've learned how to make them pretty good, right? And so it, it, it's, it, it's not quite as simple <coughs> as you would hope, that if you put in a, you know, something with a right angle in it, that it would stop, it doesn't happen. If you actually look at, at these things, you often see there's stair steps, there's all kinds of things going on if you look in detail in terms of what's going on because of. The most pathological device, I guess, would be a tunnel diode. Right. Where, where you've got the negative resistance and then mm -hmm. you can't have the negative power spectrum. Right. That's direct sort of yeah, that's a, completely. right, that's, that's like negative temperatures, yes. It mathematically looks that way, but it isn't really that way, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the thing. All right, let me go on sure. and we'll, 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 we'll argue about this later, but you know, there, there, there's lots of stuff. You can put situations where mathematically it looks like a negative temperature, right? But in fact, it's not. There's, it's a positive. Same thing is true with a tunnel layout where you have the, the reverse and the curve where it looks like you have negative, you know, resistance, but it, it's only over that, that window. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about one of my old favorites because we spent, in Berkeley, we spent years starting out to make composite, and Paul Richards was one of the pioneers in this, and we were working together, and making the composite bolometers, and then the spider web bolometers with very, very high resistant, very high purity uh, germanium and tem temperature sensors. And then eventually, uh, based on the stuff that Ken Irwin did, we switched to these voltage bias transition edge uh, bolometers. And this is the main stay of the CMB 
both for historical reasons, because it's been developed and it was all that, but also because it's one of the two devices that has proven to have the sensitivity you need to do the experiments, right? These kind of stuff. And when I say it's voltage biased, that's a way of maintaining yourself set on a particular place along the superconducting transition edge, which is not completely sharp, and if you actually look in detail, there are little stair steps and stuff. You want to sit right on that. By doing that, you change the electrical power in such a way the sum of the electrical power and the optical power, or whatever signal you're observing, if it could be other devices, other things you're looking at, is equal to a constant. And when you do that, you just then measure the change in the electrical power, and that tells you how much the optical power is. That electrical thermal feedback turns out to increase the response time of the bolometer by essentially the gain of the circuit that's doing that feedback. So if you look at this design, this was a squid, but we always use squids, sometimes just low noise amplifiers. If you look at the design, there are several parts to it. There is the superconducting, the transition edge superconductor, which is here, and an optical absorber. And they're often not exactly the same. So it takes a certain time constant from the time the photons absorb to the time the heat and the phonons get to the, to the superconductor. And then there is also a weak thermal link to a, to a heat bath so that there are, turns out, three time constants in this circuit. One which is getting the, getting the time of getting the signal to the detector, the time of, uh, of the, the, the link, the leak of the, uh, the heat back down to keep it a constant temperature, and the time uh, frequency of this circuit and the amplifier that's keeping it on the, on the, on the feedback. And so this uh, is good. This is one of the reasons, besides being sensitive and fast, it's because it's very low power dissipation if you design it very well. And the sensitivity of these can be made so that they are limited by the fluctuations in the photon arrival rate, the statistical fluctuations, what's going on. Now, that doesn't mean you're necessarily seeing individual photons. In fact, the time, so compared to what I say in the quantum optics time, the time, if you look at this sort of plot, which is from a couple years ago, is if you look over the frequency range or the temperature range, and the gamma rays, we always detect individual photons, right? You never detect a whole wave of, you don't make an interferometer and, and detect gamma rays, you just detect the individual gamma rays coming in. And that's because they interact, they're so much more energetic than the, than the binding of electrons in the materials that they cause some kind of energy disruption whatever material they're absorbed in, and then you try and measure the total amount of energy but based on the electrical distortion. And that is even true for X-rays. Here in the ultraviolets through the infrared, that is barely true. You, you're often making a filter in front of your device in order to look at the wavelength range you're seeing, and then you're getting single fold electron which you channel down either through like an avalanche diet or through a pho photomultiplier tube. And in the millimeter and submillimeter range, we've always me you know, measured them as a continuum. That is, we measure them as a wave, in the sense, up until this stage, because you just count the total power that's absorbed. So it doesn't, you don't say, here's a photon, here's a photon, here's a photon. It's you're just measuring the power, and the photon noise fluctuations are, you know, and the rate of arrival of the photons, but it's not that you're seeing individual photons, you're seeing the statistical fluctuations in the photons. What, is ha what happens now is because of going to devices like the MKIDs, the things you put in a pure quantum state, you're now at a point where you can measure each individual photon and measure its energy to some level. And now, you, you don't measure it very accurately there, but up in the high energies, you can actually measure quite accurately. And both MKIDs in, in this range, both MKIDs and uh, what we call, what are called microbolometers, which are basically the, the TESs and so forth, are the things that do the most precise measurements of the, of the frequencies. In a certain range in here, you're able to do spectral, you know, spectral distortion and you measure the, the line and then do the assumption between them, but that's the, the kind of thing. So back to the quantum optics part. Okay, so here's the distinction. So light is a wave, and it's historically dis, you know, detected as a wave, 
but it's also made of photons. So by why, why I say it's a way, well, you put it through a spectrometer, you put it through a grit, you know, through a grating, through a prism, through whatever it is, and you spread the, the wave out, and then you measure the wavelengths and, 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 uh, in terms of what's going on. Or you put it in an interferometer, and you do the, you know, you change the arm length of the interferometer, and you look for the, 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 the kind of effect. But what you're doing is you're both absorbing it on some device that's made to have the uh, impedance of free space or approximate impedance of free space, and you're absorbing that energy from free space into your detector or half of it into your detector and reflecting half. And you're just, you're just measuring it as a wave and you're, you're detecting it as a wave and you're just counting the energy per unit time that, that arrives. Okay. So my claim is that quantum optics begins when you deal with individual photons, and this started at first at high energy because you didn't have a choice, the photons just presented themselves. And with MKIDs, we can do, we can measure individual things about individual photons as well as high energy photons. Now, there are some things that are easier to do with the low energy photons and some things that are easier to do with the high energy photons. Okay, right? And we are now approaching, although most of the stuff that G will tell you about isn't quite there yet, but we're getting close. That is, we're approaching the thing. So we make the detectors to be at such low temperatures, they're in a particular quantum state. In this case, we're talking about them being superconductors. There are other kinds of things you can do. And they're in Cooper pairs, and the photon interacts and makes a lot of Cooper pairs. And the example is that because the energy scale to make a coup break, make a coup pair into quasi-particles is on the order of MeV, that is thousands of electron volts, you get a thousand times as many of them as you do when you're just making an electron out of a semiconductor. So it's roughly a thousand to one. And so a uh, optical photon will make on the scale of 5,000 of these quasi-particle pairs when it gets absorbed, if it's absorbed directly into the to the, the end kids. And then the statistics allow you to have, in principle, very good resolution. So, but you can also look for the other quantum states, and I'll mention those, and then we'll get back to talking about the end kids. And uh, so there is additional information that you can extract beyond counting each individual photon or, you know, in a given wavelength band or direction, right, is imaging and spectroscopy, basically but now in a more, more direct state. Okay, so let me, oh, this is a slightly older one. I had another, I had one more picture in here, but we'll see. So what are the detection ranges? At very high, at very high speeds, that is really high counting rates, so the, the bright sources, you can count individual photons now. You used to use phototubes, but now they've come onto the market silicon photomultiplier tubes and, and silicon particle detectors which have a focus on high time, time resolution. Much better than a nanosecond, that is, you know, picosecond kind of thing. So, so you can count individual photons. And uh, I'll give you an example of why that might be interesting and so forth. Uh, with more moderate speed, that is, that's why this other plot was missing where we were talking, you know, uh, microsecond or, or longer time between photons. Uh, you can measure uh, uh, many of other things. And so, unfortunately, on my computer, but not on the copy I brought over, there's a little plot that shows an example of an MKID uh, resolving a, a, a laser line. And you can see <coughs> the individual pho individual's photons coming in and giving you a nice waveform and then showing up in a nice little relatively narrow Gaussian. Okay, so how does that compare to what, what are people now doing? So JPAS, which is, this is a place in the, sort of the eastern part of, of Spain in the mountains, and uh, there's a couple of observed, couple of telescopes that are built, and it's designed with a set of, of cameras that have 50 filters on them. Okay. So you just go out and look at the sky, and each pass has like five filters in front of each of the CCD set of stuff, and you measure part of the sky, and then you do it again, and you get, you scan out and measure that, and this is the spectra of a, of a particular kind of a galaxy, right? 
The other thing that's going on and just starting this year, same as this, this just finished a one degree survey to test it and it's gonna go into a bigger survey, are, are the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which has the 5,000 fibers and 10 spectrographs, so 500 galaxies per each spectrograph. And it will, it has a, you know, spectroscopic thing because you're using a grating and you're just measuring the, the wavelength. And you, you get it very precisely and you find very fine lines and that's sort of the gold standard for how you do spectroscopy. That's, but that's what we've been doing for 200 years is, is, or more than 200 years, is doing kind of spectroscopy. The goal with some kind of a detector like this would be to be able to measure the each galaxy and have these five these 50 bands and be able to make what's called a photo redshift whereas this is a spectroscopic redshift this is very precise and very good this is in many studies thought to be sufficiently accurate to do a galaxy survey and and assign redshift to 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 essentially all the galaxies with very few outliers. Now, there, that depends on what galaxy spectra look like and how many, whether you get some really weird galaxies or something, but that's another case. In principle, the MKIDs should be able to do a little better than this in terms of just put it on the sky, put your array of MKIDs, and I'll talk that at the end of the talk, put it on the sky, measure one exposure, measure the energy each photon you have coming in, and make a plot of the energy you know, the, the number versus energy of the photons, and it should give you a spectra that looks similar to that spectra, a little, a little bit better. Right now, they're not doing that yet, but they're, they're like a factor of six to 10 away from that, so, uh, but it's very early stages. Okay, so let me go back to the additional information that what doing the wave and doing the whatever is doesn't give us, and here's an example of that. This is photon statistics. And all of you have heard about the one case where people have used photon statistics to do a measurement in astronomy, and that's the Hanbury Brown twist measurement of the diameter of a star. You, that's the spatial coherence length. You can also do a time coherence length, which I'll get to you in a couple more slides. Okay, so it turns out that you would think that if you had a source of light, the photons would either come with Poisson statistics. That turns out to be true, but it's moderately rare compared to the fact that it usually comes with super Poissonian statistics. However, because of quantum mechanics, you can have sub Poissonian statistics. You cannot have that classically, but because of quantum mechanics, you can. So this is just an example of a Poisson distribution, right? At, at n average equals 100, and then so, just to show you what those things are. Okay, so let's, what's an example of that, okay? Well, in the sub Poissonian, we're gonna see the delta N is less than the square root of the average, whereas in Poisson statistics, the square root of the average and super Poissonian statistics. What, which ones do we have experience with, okay? So here's one where the, the distribution is six, and here's one where the distribution is nine, and this is the Poisson distribution, and this is the Bose-Einstein distribution. Whenever you have a thermal source, like a star, it actually has a distribution that's broader than Poissonian, and that's because there is the chance that photons are correlated, right? That's, that's what Hanbury brown twist depends on. So the Bose-Einstein is the thermal distribution, and the Poisson is what you get from a laser, which is sort of surprising, so you have to think about this for a while. But, oh, uh, and, there's another, uh, there's another kind of example, which I will show you, which can get sub on, and that becomes important as we move into the quantum optics region, where you can actually see things individually, and also important, as I mentioned, for quantum computing and for quantum, quantum uh, communications, right? So here's an example, is resonant fluorescence for a photon. So this is the way people who are working in the quantum uh, range, see that they get a quantum dot, okay? So that's a name for a quantum dot. That means you've got a one individual thing where you can change, where you're controlling one qubit, right? As you're, you're controlling one quantum state. And it, it works, I don't know why I get extra stuff here. You have laser light comes in through this 
this uh, polarizer, which you can then change around. It goes in and hits your quantum dots, and the photons come out evenly spaced. And it's a simple thing to understand because what you're doing is you're pumping. There's a certain time period for the photon to get absorbed, which you can make the laser light brighter and it gets short. And there's a time which for the photon to decay. And then, then you have to raise it up again and decay it again. So you get this sawtooth pumping, and it spaces, because of the various quantum effects, it spaces the photons out evenly. Right? This is just the way you'd do it if you were doing it, right? And so forth. So statistically, you can measure this by the outer correlation function. So if you look at the second order intensity, G is just the number you're getting, right? G, G1. G2, you can then make with a autocorrelation with a time delay between what's going on. And the, the, if you do it this way, attenuation doesn't affect G. And I will show you an example of attenuation to show you you would have thought that attenuation would affect your G, but it doesn't. It, it's, it's easier to calculate. It's like having mixing pixels in your map. When you do the autocorrelation, you can kind of compensate for it, but you can't do the, the, the straight transform. So if G of zero is equal to one, then you have no, no correlation. It's random. It's completely random. So it would be flat across here. This is the time delay from zero. It would be one at zero. It would be flat across here. If you have G greater than one, that's bunching and photons wrapped together, this is, goes up to two. This is exactly what you expect for Bose-Einstein distribution. This is Hanbury-Brown twist, right? So it's twice as likely to, for a photon, two photons to be together than to just be random. But in the long run, they've got to get out to one and be uncorrelated in the, in the very long run. And you can have anti-bunching, and anti-bunching would go like that. If it's perfectly anti-bunched, it would get to zero, right? That's, that's kind of strange, right? But it's, the, it, it, it's, it, it's easy enough to do that. So again, we're used, everybody should be used to doing power spectra. Before we did power spectra, we used to do <laughs> correlation functions because they're a little easier to do when you have a cut sky. But we'll see. Okay. Sorry. Yeah? How do you get anti-bunching at zero, or is it at zero? Yeah, well, I'll show you. <laughs> okay. But you, you get it at zero. It, it, that they're spaced apart, right? Your chances of a no photon when you've got one photon is small. Your chances when they're far apart are is one. They're anti-bunched. They don't ever appear together, right? That's, it's, it, it, you know, electrons do that. You're not, you don't have a trouble with that, but you don't, <laughs> you do have trouble with photons because photons like each other, right? So in your setup, it might be anti-bunching. Is it necessary that the laser just one atom. It, it, it's it, not it, one it, atom. It's actually a circuit. It, it's a whole circuit. Several atoms. No, no. It, you make several circuits atoms. where it's that way, and so it's 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 a more complicated. Thing. But yeah, it, you eventually want to get in the business of doing building circuits that are made of atoms. One one atom here, back and forth. Right? That's where you would like to go. Fifty years from now, everybody's gonna, you know you're going to be walking around with your your handheld supercomputer. <laughs> And it's going to be telling you which way to go and what to do. <laughs> okay, so here's a plot that can makes it a little, sorry, little. Sorry, can I ask you a question about? This? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, you you consider the um, the correlation in, in terms of time are rival on the detector on one Yeah, point. these are time. Yeah, so tau is the time delay. It's where you you take the two curves and you move them and multiply them and you see what happens. And when they're exactly lined up, you get a peak yeah. if they're bunched. If there, if there are, you know, anti-bunch, you get a, a dip, and if you're, if they're like a laser, it doesn't matter. It's the same everywhere. Yeah. And, and my question is that if you consider one detector and so the time arrival of, of the photon on this detector, what about the correlations that you can have if you consider two uh, detector close to, uh, to, right. to the other one? So, so the correlation. So, so in, in there was an space. experiment up here. <laughs> okay. the, called out. It's very simple. It's a kind of a thought experiment, but it's actually not so much. In the lab, we have a little setup kind of like this that we're tr testing, right? But it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of thing. But it's you have a beam splitter, a 50-50 beam splitter, and you put two different detectors there. If you have a single photon, the photon goes one or other, but the, it's so you don't get 
you know, you, you, you take one detector against the other detector here. So that keeps me from using the same detector and seeing the, the same photon twice, right? Okay, yeah. but in this case, you, you consider a single beam and, and two detectors. And what about <laughs> if you have two beams close to too close yes. to the other and you consider the correlation in space in between two Yes, ones. right, so that's Hanbury Brown and Twist, right? So they take the two telescopes and they slowly move them apart yeah. until the correlation exactly. drops to zero, right? And, and, and you can do it in time. So that's a space one, you can do it in time also and see the same thing, same, same kind of thing, right? So, yeah, it's nothing mad, I mean, we've known about photon physics for a while, we just, you know, I mean, I did an experiment years ago to see the CMB was kind of right, you know, but I, the, the detectors weren't quite so good in those days. So I could only do a partial test, but I use a correlation receiver to try and do that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, right? And it, you'll, it'll come up, I'll give you one example from cosmology, astros and cosmology where you care about this. Okay, so back to this kind of stuff. So here are schematics of the bunch light beam, the random light beam, that's the laser, right, and the anti-bunch beam, okay? So now here's where my comment about the attenuation doesn't matter. Every now and then a photon's missed. In fact, in this one, a lot of photons are missed. There would be more, more of them evenly spaced. But when you use the, the, the cross-correlation, it, it takes care of itself. It, it, it shows up in the right way. And likewise for here. So these are examples where it's slightly attenuated, so you don't get every photon, right, through your detectors. You still statistically are going to get a, a, a you know, going to show up these kinds of things. And this guy will give you the sub Poissonian distribution of, you know, of number, but also will give you the, 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 the cross correlation having a dip to negative value which is not something that you're allowed in any classical wave form for, for photons. Okay, so you guys are ready. Here's the actual data from a resonant Florence quantum dot. Okay, and now this is a, unfortunately at a high energy because it's a solid state guy, not a M kids. And uh, you will notice you get these things, except here you didn't get one, right? and so forth. And if you, if you look at G of 2 at 0, it's 0 0.12 plus or minus 0 0.09. It's pretty close to 0. It's not exactly 0. When you get a lot of little ways it goes to 1, you get to 0, you just don't see them because there's only one photon that's either one detector or the other one. Right? And so we'll, we'll, we'll see. But when you start displacing them, then the photons can line up and not line up. Right? If, I, if I uniformly space my fingers, you know, if I only have one photon, it's either in my right hand or my left hand, right? But when I have them spread out all randomly, left hand and right hand, as I move around, I will get, I will get this, this set of peaks. And the peaks should be up here at one. And you see they're approximately one. So these guys published this, so proud that they had a quantum dot and they proved that it, that it, that it worked, okay? All right, and this is, so there are a few cases in nature where you have resonant fluorescence and you get this kind of phenomenon. But in, in astros and cosmology, I think it's going to be pretty <coughs> rare, but we'll, we'll see. All right, however, there is an example I have from cosmology, <laughs> from an ancient paper. Oh, it fell off the bottom here. Sorry, I can't read my notes. Okay, so here's the usual one where the uh, but backwards, because Z is on the outside instead of on the inside, right? Okay, and so the Big Bang started. As it expands out, it gets to a point where the universe is getting ready to be transparent. And there are some places where there are over densities and under densities. And in those cases, you can have lasers. You will get these lasers and they will shoot out and come at you across the universe. Unfortunately, they're not very big, but if you were a crazy guy and you wanted to do something really unique and new in the CMB, you'd look to see there were lasers from the universe. And they're redshifted, right? Because they're redshifted down to the millimeter waves. Right? That's the, the kind of thing. But there's a place out here, whenever reionization of the universe begins, you will have regions in which you have a lot of lime and alpha, a lot of other stuff being pumps, and you'll have regions that are, that are cooling 
and you can have inverted populations and you can get lasers and masers. And so you expect that to happen, uh, you know, at this, at this part where it's deionizing and at this part where it's reionizing. You expect those two situations to occur. And, uh, you know, it will, uh, it will be something you could conceivably look for. You know, I haven't gone through all the numbers to see how hard, how hard or easy this is. My guess is it's pretty difficult to do, but it's possible to think about making these kind of observations. And here you can distinguish them because as soon as you can get into the region where you can count individual photons, you can measure G2, right, of tau, right, and, and, and see what it looks like. In astrophysics, though, there are a lot of lasers and masers. They're very common, and, uh, oh, I cut this off. But this, is a, this has to do with the density and the, and the, uh, and the, 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 the fraction of what's going on. But there, there are things out in astrophysical size that are mega masers. They're really huge. And they're, they're big galactic clouds that are producing these kinds of things. There are some interstellar lasers. And there are lasers near stars. A big fraction of the stars that have big winds have lasers associated with them particularly stars near the end of their life, but all the stars that have a really large winds, most of them have lasers and masers associated with them. And to people's surprise, it, there's the first maser up there. The, this is, there's a laser in the atmosphere of Mars. There's also, it turns out to be one in Venus, but, that's, but Mars was the one that was first discovered. And this is Nova Laser, for those of you who are familiar with Lawrence Livermore Lab, inertial confinement, early day studies. And this is the quantum dot laser. So these are the guys we play with, and these are the guys that the next generation of detectors are playing with. And there are other examples. So Eta Carina is a famous situation where it's a star that has a huge outflow. And in this outflow, it's a very hot star. And this outflow is putting out a huge flux of lime and alpha photons and very energetic photons. And then that is heating up a cooling cloud and pumping up the atoms in that cloud to an inverted population. And then nearby, they do laser. And further out, they do masers. So it's a sequence of lasers and maser, laser, and then lower and lower energy masers as it goes out. And there's another star that I think is very interesting, or a double star system, although we don't know for sure it's a double star system. Uh, but now you do. <laughs> so this is the famous ant nebula, because it kind of looked like an ant. And uh, it, uh, at least the astronomers looking through telescopes, this is a really nice picture of it. And uh, it, it has some very powerful lasers in it. Further out, it has some masers, but the lasers are what's most noticeable for. And by looking at those, they have seen that it's apparently a binary star, because they're, they're actually frequency shifted a little bit in, the, in, the, in what's going on. So there are things out there. And what people have had to do when you measure an image in the spectra, you have to assume what the physical conditions are and what state things are in, in terms of, the, of, of what the photons are coming from, where they're coming from. So some of us went and heard the talk about the FRBs. And the question is, what is producing that radiation? It's synchrotron? Is it curvature radiation? Is it you know, some other kinds of thing going on. And there, maybe having some extra photons this will help. Okay. All right, so I'll change the topic. And I'm going to talk about photon orbital angular momentum. <coughs> okay. So this is a topic that people knew about it, but most people have ignored, right? Photons have a lot of extra properties. And we always assume they're coming to us with either spin one or spin minus, you know, they're either coming towards it, the left-handed or right-handed, right? That's the situation. However, a photon can have hundreds of different states, right? It, it can carry many different kinds of overwhelming momentum. Now, we kind of knew that if we ever had to take an atomic physics course when we were young students, but we forgot, right? And so forth. So in the laboratory, and for some years it's been that way, and I was reminded of this when I was called on, is that, that people have been able to prepare photons with an angular momentum up to 300. And that means you can have a single photon carry eight bits of information. Okay, that's 
pretty useful in communications. And it also means the argument of the, like the web miracle, the argument about the water hole being the most efficient, you know, number of bits and so forth is not necessarily correct because now you can think about other ways you can do it. So this is really of a, a lot of interest for quantum computing and for quantum information, but it's a, that's a lot of interest in that. However, a few years ago, either five or six years ago, I was contacted by Utelsat because there were a group of Italians who claimed they had invented a way to use, put angular momentum into microwaves and they had a special antenna and they set up a demonstration. They did this, this kind of thing. And I think they first started in Florence and they did it in Rome and had a big announcement and got patents. And they were trying to get Utelsat to give them a huge amount of money to be able to build and show antennas they could put on the satellites and therefore increase the downlink from satellites by a huge factor. Because now you can, you can send extra channels on each angular momentum then, right? Now it turns out they act like it was all new and so forth, but the people in, people who were doing um, in, you know, um, fiber, you know, optical fibers actually have been doing experiments where they put angular momentum on photons in order to get extra channels in, in, in fibers. Right? And so this is known to a few engineers, <laughs> not, known to, not known to the general public because you forget because you don't remember that some of the, 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 the atomic physics you know, transitions went from different L states, right? They, the, the, the photons themselves had a, L, yeah, had, a, had a spin, but they also had an angular momentum that also went with them. But it's very interesting to people who were doing, you know, the quantum kind of activities. So this is an example of an experiment, and they, they have a, a really nice graphics with their paper, of quantum walks and wave packet dynamics on a, last, on a lattice with twisted photons. Okay, they got good, good, good words too. So what's going on here? They have these devices, which are called the, the quantum walk devices. You send the laser beam in, it's in the usual single state. It's in a, you know, L equals zero, you know, just plus at one orientation. And you do a quantum walk unit. Now what's a quantum walk? Well, the quantum walk is the thing that we all know and love, which is the random walk. This is a true one-dimensional walk, right? Remember, you had to work a problem sometime in your life where there's a random walk, right, diffusion, right? And, you, and if you ever looked at Einstein's paper on, you know, brain and motion and everything, you realize math is hard and so forth. But a one-dimensional walk is very straightforward, right? So here's a case where every time it goes, it gets kicked in M one way or the other, right, in terms, of, in terms of what's happening. And one of the things that happens in all these circuits is you're always making the light or the, the microwave thing go in one direction. You're always coupling or so forth, doing things to make, the, to channel them forward in a certain time. So when it goes through this quantum walk, it has a random chance of ending up in one of three states. Right? And likewise, when it goes through the next one, it has a random chance of ending up in five states. And if it goes to the next one, it's got, you know, seven states that it can end up in. And it's random, right? This is how you can make entangled state, complicated and random states in a random walk with a probability distribution that you can use for quantum communications or for quantum computing. That is, that's, it's, a, it's, it's a cool trick, right? And these guys aren't that complicated. They, 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 they're like, you know, they're, they're like a quarter wave plate and a, and, a, and, a ha and, a, and a filter and a half wave plate. And you just do those things and you, it's random where it, which way it goes and how it comes out. Can, can you think as classically if you have a, a wave guy that's not in market and then you put an obstacle <laughs> that's, uh, you know, not... I suspect uh, you could do something... I didn't draw this. I took this out of their paper. Completely <laughs> classical um, interpretation. It could be, except that the angular momentum is completely quantized, right? It is classic. You can make you can make it so your waveguides that you're only a single mode in the waveguide, which is kind of forcing a quantum mechanical. You put boundary conditions in so that modes are that way, 
but here, this is, you know, your quantum mechanics is forcing you to go only in these states, and you can bring, you have several photons that are coming together entangled. And so you can actually use these as an entangled state later on. So one of the big things in quantum communication and so forth is to actually make photons in, a, in entangled states, send them somewhere, you know, and then send them back or send, send some signal back that you need to be able to do in such a way that nobody else can decode it except you and your communicator person, right? Sure. But if I take a cylindrical copper pipe, I right. the M star quantized Quantum yeah, so exactly. Quantum yeah, but that's because you put the boundary conditions on and, and so forth. But then you don't have the entangled states to, to make use of later. This is this is a way sure, to create sure. the. You, right. you can add stuff to make it. Right. Make it okay, so all of this is supposed to make you realize that there's a certain set of circuits and devices you need for the next generation, which is going to be we're going to we we discovered quantum mechanics about a hundred years ago. 1920s, right? So we're in the 2020s, barely, <laughs> and uh, almost. And we're finally going to be moving into where we're making things that are quantum mechanical things, right? It's 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 another kind of stuff. And and the the M kids are almost there. They're they're partly there, and they're but they they will easily go forward to being that in that kind of a thing. So quantum computing is going to be cool because it's going to let you make a single personal identification that only you have the keys to and so forth. But here's examples of drawings of things that people are actually making. They're making these arrays where they can tell that array to send out a single photon. So here, you know, send a single photon and it will send a single photon. That's, so there are devices like that that people make sort of a series of bumps and then they can they can tell that bump to send a photon forward, right? and only one photon right, at that time. And it's in a pretty narrow frequency range because they're basically lasing in a certain sense using quantum, a quantum transition. Okay, and here, just to remind you, this is IBM's new, new like last year, uh, five-bit universal quantum computer. It's actually available to you in the cloud. To, to, it's actually operating. You can actually run programs on it. Although it's only got five bits, and so you can only do programs up to a certain level, problems up to a certain level. But if you look at this circuit, you will see some of the some of the things that we do with M kids and with other things are basically the same kinds of circuits. That's that that there there are there are inductors and capacitors and, and and things that you put in in particular states, and they're fixed unique quantum state. In order to do that, you have to be operating at a temperature well below the, the superconducting transition for, or the quantum transition for whichever kind of device you're using. Okay, so, and here's another example. This is a current example of quantum communications. So it's about two years ago, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was. Two years ago, the Chinese launched into orbit after doing some ground tests of showing the things that we've done, launch into orbit a quantum communications satellite. That's because ever since uh, a certain person who's now in Russia released a bunch of data about how much the US was watching everybody in the world, the Chinese got paranoid and wanted to be able to talk to each other and their embassies without. So this green line is the trajectory of the satellite. The satellite's sending a laser to this ground station, which is also sending a laser back to that and this kind of thing. And uh, so that satellite is tracing that green line out because that's the color of the laser that it's happened to be using, I believe. And it communicates with the ground station in northern China and you see it in, the long for, in, in, in this long exposure. And their claim is this allows a perfectly um, you know, secure form of communications and that generally relies on the fact that the no clone theorem. There's a theorem in quantum mechanics that you can't clone a quantum state perfectly. You can't make an exact copy of it. Now that's a problem for quantum computing because the way quantum computing is going to work is you have to have five copies of your original state 
so they can vote at the end whether they're right because you have to correct, be correcting any errors along the way. However, this, this one exists and it, it, uh, it works fairly well. It actually does entangle states and it actually sends entangled state information up and does a, a thing which I showed you where using laser light to excite some known states and then send the signal back, right? And, and, you, and, and send back the entangled state. And uh, it is, it is uh, not ultra cold, although eventually some of these detectors will become ultra cold in order to be in a quantum state. And uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon and uh, it's not that complicated now to do that. And the reason this is relevant is you want to be able to do this over the internet too. So in principle, you can build a system in which you send entangled states over the internet and therefore communicate. So in practice, you have to then have repeaters and certain other things, and so it becomes a little trickier, but it's, it's within the range of what people are technically able to do now. Okay, so let me get back to the, towards the kids. Okay, so there's all these photons coming or going. I don't know which way they're heading in this picture, but it's supposed to be a pretty picture. But you have this rain of photons coming down on you, and you're going to have buckets, big pixels or little pixels and so forth. Right? So that's just to show you the concept of big, medium, and large pixel, right? or just a small pixel and a large pixel. If you have you know, a heavy rain, this guy will fill up fat. You know, this guy collects rain at a, at a huge rate, or will collect photons at a huge rate. And if you want any resolution, you want small pixels, or if you want to see each individual photon with a lot of time, you might want small pixels. That means you get driven towards a huge number of pixels unless you're in a situation where you know the signal is very weak and you can use bigger pixels and get away with it. So that is one of the, the issues when you're talking about quantum optics is how many pixels are you going to need and how many things you got to do to read out and to deal with. Right? Okay, so let me get back to the, let's see how we're doing for time. Compare the TES and M kids, <coughs> and then you will you'll see. So here is, the, is the, a, a, a photo, almost micrograph, of a TES. This distance across here is about 100 microns from here to here. So this is where the, the transition edge is. This is where the, the wire comes in. The two wires come in, and one goes to one side, one goes to the other. And that's transition edge. This is the absorber and capacitance and so forth in this system. And then it's sitting on this substrate, which has the gold absorber. So what you do to make it absorb right for microwave photons is you put a thin layer of a metal on and you make the surface resistance of the metal 377 ohms per square, which is the same as free space. And in our case, you also put a back short at a quarter wavelength that's the, in order to, to, to make the reflection even less, right? That's, that's the, so that's what we ended up doing. And we started that with the composite bolometers and got better and more sensitive and Eventually, the, the, the went, went from the spider web to this kind of a spider web uh, bolometer because y you can make a spider web out of the metal too and make its resistance the same. So you have a big area and you have to conduct the heat down to the, 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 the resistance or the center resistance area. Okay. Now here is an example of an M kid. This is the Inductance part, this is the capacitance part, this is the coupling part, right? And there's a ground strap here, and you have a, a, a strip line going along there that does the, that carries the signal in and out. Right? So this is a single element, you're gonna make big arrays, right? You, you have to make big arrays of each of those, and I, I had a, I, I eventually ran out of internet here, I was gonna do one more plot, but I had a plot about how we've improved with time, and there's a Moore's law for detector sensitivity that we had for bolometers that went on for, for a couple of decades that every couple of years we got a factor two improvement till we got down to where we were starting to get near the quantum limit and then you just had to put bigger arrays together. And that's the, the, the issue. And so then you'll see a plot I have a little later on where you'll see that the size of arrays is growing 
But it, it's exactly what's happening in computing, that as the, as the size of the, of the transistor gates is getting smaller and smaller, people have been going to more and more processors and a computer in order to keep on the Moore's Law for keeping the computing power going on. And so the, the name of the game these days with these detectors, as we're getting close to the quantum limit, is just more detectors. That is, you just get more things looking on the sky. All right, so let me go back and focus on the, the kinetic inductance device. So the, the, the basic concepts here are photons are incident on a strip of superconducting material. They break Cooper pairs, very low energy cost to break Cooper pairs, and create excess quasiparticles. The kinetic inductance of the connecting strip is inversely proportional to the density of Cooper pairs, and the kinetic inductance increases upon the photon absorption, and that's the kind of thing. So if you conduct, if you put the inductor with a capacitor, you have your favorite electronic circuit past the resistor, which is the LC oscillator, right? It's a resonator. And it's a micro, you, you design it to be a microwave resonator, which changes its resonant frequency with the absorption of the photons. So you can measure the energy deposited by measuring the change in the frequency. It's, there, there are two other ways to do it, and I'll explain it. So this resonator-based readout is useful for making large format arrays as if you make each kid slightly different, so that its resonant frequency is separate, is different, you can put on them all on the same strip line and see each one of them's resonant shift a little bit, but not interfere with the other one. That's the tricky part. And you can then use a, a broadband microwave channel, because you've made these guys to be resonant in the microwave. You can use a broadband microwave channel and frequency division multiplexing which is a trick we used to use with bolometers by, by actually biasing them with a, a given frequency. But then when we got the electrofeedback, it became a different kind of a, of a situation. All right, so let me go through each of these simply. This is so when G talks, you're, you're all in, <laughs> you're, you're understanding the basics and you're, and you're realizing what actually goes on to make one of these things work. Okay, so the basic principle is you're, you're cooling it somewhere between a third or, or preferably a tenth of, this, of, the, of the critical temperature. So it's, comp it's basically on a, in a well-defined state. You have a Cooper pair. A photon comes in from some nebula or something and takes those two electrons that are in the Cooper pair and boosts them by two delta, where delta is the minimum energy to do it, and makes two quasi-particles, right? So, this is a super current and it has a certain inductance. This is a normal current and it has a certain resistance to it. Right? So you're changing the impedance by changing R and L. And when you're exciting it with uh, microwaves, omega, then you'll, you'll, you'll see these effects. Right? So a little bit more detail. So this one's got a light bulb. I prefer the galaxy or whatever it is. So here is a very simple version of the, of, of, the, of the circuit. You, you have, you'll see why it's so long. You have the light, the photon coming, breaking the Cooper pair, raising it up to a normal, right? You now have a variable inductance and you have it in an LC circuit, right? So what happens is when you're in the normal situation, you have a resonance that looks like that the Q is actually very sharp. That's important. <coughs> I'll, I'll show you. And then when you break some Cooper pairs, you move it to here. Y you have resistance, so the signal level goes down. So you have an amplitude change. You have a frequency change. And later on, you'll show there's a phase change, too. So the Cooper pair go to quasi-particles, higher resistance and kinetic inductance. The dip depth uh, changes, the amplitude because of the resistance, the resonant frequency, and the phase change because of the inductance. And this was brought out in a simple paper in 2003 by Day et al. And I have one more slide of, that highlights their, their, their kind of activity and shows the phase information too. Um, but here you have all the uh, Cooper pairs lying here at this, you know, essentially the zero energy level. And the photon has to break a bunch of these and make it up there. 
And if you have a very low energy photon, it only brings a few quasi particles up. If you have a very high energy photon, it can make thousands or tens of thousands and so forth. So that's the, what's going on. And this is for those of you that know microwave, the word, this is a Smith chart of the reactants. And, and you see what happens when you go from one curve to the other, that you see the shape, and you're looking for the, for the changes in this uh, in terms of what's going on. I think I have another slide to talk about this mortar in general. So again, there's, a, there's one bad thing, is that most of the time, it's just the energy, and there's a small band for which the, what the, Cooper, the quasi particles get to go into. But if you go to a certain distance, there's a much bigger band. And so that creates a little bit of error in how many quasi particles you get per photon energy. But it's not a huge effect because that, that energy leaks back down in a certain effect. But you get, you get the change in amplitude, you get the change in frequency, and you get the change in the phase in the circuit because you're changing that. And how do you read it out? Well, there are several different ways to read this out. The way that's often done is you synthesize a bunch of frequencies. You measure your, your, your AI system. You know, you, you go and you shock the system. You see all the resonators resonate, or you excite them by shining light sequentially on lights on them. And you measure the frequency of each of your pixels. And then you make a frequency that excites that pixel. And you send that frequency down the line, the whole coma frequencies down the line. And they read out each one of the detectors, each one of the detectors in here, these lines. And then on this side, you use that same frequency to mix with it, and you see the signal level you get out. So that's one way you do it. One of the ways we do things at the beginning now is something that we should have thought about at the beginning, and that is we just hit it with a big impulse, and the whole system resonates. H guy resonate resonates, and it decays with a 1 over E time, which is reasonably short. And you lose about 20 to 30 percent sensitivity, but you don't have to make all these things. You can just you can just see this, and you make it oscillate at the, its peak frequency. So your signal you make up the reason you don't lose completely is you make up because you're you're seeing it on its peak and so forth. But there are other techniques that, that people use. That is, they they just sweep the frequency across and then do a spectrum analysis at the end and, and look at what's going on. But there are various kinds of things to do. So the, 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 the point here is it's a little more complicated than what I talked about. The superconductors have an AC inductance due to the, mo the, due to the inertia, the, the mass inertia of the Cooper pairs, or due to the fact that there's mag energy, magnetic energy stored when they're screening uh, the super, the super uh, conductor with a super current, right? When the Cooper pairs are broken by the photon energy and creating quasi particles, you know you can sense the change in the resonant circuit. And the key point is the superconductors can provide a very high Q. That is, they have been you know achieved up to ten to the seventh. So that if you have uh, a reasonably wide microwave bandwidth you're, you're, you're interrogating with, you can put thousands of detectors, you know, you could in principle put up to a million detector, and you can see eventually we want to have millions of detectors in some of these arrays and so forth. So there's an enormous cryogenic multiplex technology relative to the existing technology because essentially one microwave strip line can read out very large number of these detectors. So you don't have to put so many wires down under the cryostat, which is an issue, right? And I got a couple more examples here of the MKIT operation. So here's the thing, which is a quarter wave resonator. So you essentially have the feed line where you're going to read it out from, and you have this L shape. So this guy is coupled, directionally coupled to this feed line in order to fit in. And then it looks like this, and you look, you can see, there's a shorted end, you can see where the current is and what, what goes on, where <coughs> it's most sensitive. And this is where you want to be absorbing the energy, the photon coming in, in order to see what's going on. And you have a, a uh, you know, you have the sort of the standard kinematic part, and you have the standard magnetic part, or the geometrical part, that are providing you the, uh, the inductance, and then you have the C of the capacitor that you've built into your circuit. Particularly in this particular one is a very simple case. This is the capacitor, right? And uh, so breaking the energy pairs 
changes the conductance, and so that's what's going on. So let me go into a little bit more detail on this. Okay, so we're used to energy being stored in an inductor as a half the inductance times the current squared. So now I'm going to be able to derive the inductance. And we usually think of it in terms of energy stored in a magnetic field, right? However, it can also be in the kinetic energy of the electrons, or it can be <coughs> in the case of the anti, the supercurrent kind of stuff. So imagine you have this thing I drew as a, a rectangle because that's what PowerPoint let me do easily. But it has area A and length L, strange font L. And the current going through here is simply equal to the area times the number of pairs times the electric charge, effective electric charge times the velocity, right? And uh, so you can find the, 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 the velocity by just dividing that. And you can work out the, the kinetic energy of a half mv squared and set that equal to half L squared. And you plug in here and you find that L is equal to the, the effective mass of the Cooper pair times the length divided by the area divided by the number of conductors and the charge. That's just what it is. So if you want it to be a big inductor, you make the length long and the area, the cross-sectional area small. That's why you see all these meanders, that just in order to get the, the detector along. Okay, so in the DC case, the Cooper pairs carry the charge without scattering. There's no internal E fields. In the AC case, there's a phase shift between I and V, which is what inductance does. Right? Capacitance does too, but inductance does it. And at low temperature to first order, the kinetic inductance is constant. The second order, it varies linearly or inverse linearly with the number of pairs. So any phase shift in the E field inside the conductor re leads to non-zero resistance from the particle currents. And so it, it varies a lot with, with you know, it, it varies in order to try and see these things. So you have to think about how you're doing your measurement, your inductance, whether you're doing it kinetically or by, by shielding the, the magnetic fields, but it's, it's the kind of thing to go on. Okay, and so here's a, this is the a slide I showed when we did the, the things to get the, the new refrigerator we have for the, <laughs> for the kids. And this was the, the traditional slide from, from the Day at All article in 2003. And here was an early measurement of a 256 pixel uh, through a coax uh, where you chain all these guys together and you're reading them off of one strip line. And you can see there's quality control. You would like to just slowly drift their, their frequency, resonant frequency along the way so they all are separated. And you want them all to be roughly the same magnitude. And you can see every now and then you have collisions. And that's a, that's a quality control problem that you have to do. As we, just like in silicon, silicon manufacturing, people learn how to get the yield up. You have to learn how to, we have, the, have been having to learn how to get the yield up. Now the yield is pretty good for some groups. Okay, so here's the example of, of the kind of types. That's the, the, the quarter wavelength, you know, there's quarter wavelength and half wavelength, and three quarter wavelength. And here's a lumped element kinetic inductance. This is what we've been spending most of our time on, where there's a capacitor here, and an inductor here and strip line in order to measure what's going on. And what you want to do is couple the photon absorption to the inductor. Okay, so why is the superconductor so useful at high frequencies? This is reiteration. The filters have very low insertion loss. So, right, th that means the filters can be made small. You can get a lot of speed in the spectrometer or however you're trying to measure it. And the transmission lines can carry really short pulses with little distortions. That is, you can, you can make measurements of photons at relatively high frequency. There are going to be times when people are going to want to look at more intense sources and you want to be able to do that. And the, there is a basic flux, which is, gives you the scale of the kind of signal you have to be dealing with. Okay, so you, superconducting transmission lines are, are really good. They're a simple version where you simply have a micro, skip, micro strip where the current's going along there, and you have a ground plane, and you have the electric field going across that way, right? I'll show you in the next slide some other stuff. And you just make a series of these, and they have the kinetic and the geometrical inductances, and they move, the, you just move them down the, 
the, the, the readout line. Now, here's an example on the upper left of a different kind of a strip line where you have two ground planes on either side and a center ship where, the, where you're carrying things. So manufacturing these, you want to be able to build a big array, so you want to think of what's the simplest thing you can manufacture in terms of what's going on. And so it, here's an example of something that's essentially one dimensional. I mean, it's two dimensional, but it's, it's in one dimension, you pretty much ignore it, where you have the inductor and the capacitor and the strip line all just printed on one surface. That's to make life easy on you. And then you get, you know, a resonance here at six gigahertz, which is 500, you know, le much less than 500 kilohertz wide. So you can stack a whole lot of these guys close to each other. Does the width come from the glasses and the spray, or is it? Uh, it's it, it's a number of things, but it but there is some resistance to the circuit itself, not not just the substrate, but the you know, when you get the normal current in there. And so it has to do with what temperature you're running at and, and, uh, and a lot of other things. So there are some normal, there's some quasi-particles in there and they have some resistance and, they, and, and they're affecting part of it. There are other things and so it depends on the material you're using, it depends on a lot of things. Sorry, John. Sorry. What is this, uh, this aluminum part here we have? A small, small pad of aluminum in the middle of the aluminum circuit? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the... What's the aluminum pad there? The aluminum pad was to to, uh, to bond things to, to test. Uh, at least I think that's what it was. But that that's for them to to be able to go in and probe the circuit and test the circuit. Right. Well, one of the things you have to do when you build a big array is you have to if some guy's not behaving right, you want to test to see if uh, if if it's a problem or you know if it's something what you did. Okay, so I do I I put this in because I had to, I thought I had extra time but now I have less time. So there are three hallmarks of superconductivity. I was only gonna say these because uh, I thought I had extra time and I thought I'd remind you. So the zero, you know, when you get to the critical temperature, you go to zero resistance. It's actually more complicated. It goes up a little bit more smoothly and the normal resistance is going down that other way. And then you have to take those into account. The superconductivity is c completely diamagnetic. That is when you get Below the critical temperature, there is no magnetic field in the superconductor, right? So this is uh, why it's, it, we'll see why it's relevant in the next slide. And there are macroscopic quantum effects. There's a flux zero, which is some multiple of, of the smallest flux, and that's why you get the Josephson effect. That's why we use things like the Josephson junction for low, uh, you know, very low noise amplifiers. So so those are the three things that you're looking for, and each of those affect the kids in different ways. Right? Okay, so the zero resistance, this is camera like, I think it was ohmness, but I mis maybe misspelled. Uh, this was their original data, but in fact, this is not quite a straight line. It's, you know, and somehow by accident, with the stuff they use it, it made little steps in it. But, it's pretty close to a very abrupt jump, right, in terms of what's going on. And here you have the Cooper pairs, and here you have the energy gap, and then you have an extra part, not very large, but it goes up there, where you, you, you don't have to exit exactly the two delta uh, of energy out of your photon. You can get, end up getting more, and so forth. So already, that's one of the things that affects how accurately you can measure, you know, if you, if it was exactly one state to the other state, you could measure the photon energy extremely precisely. And, and uh, uh, you know, even, in, even if it's digitized, if you think it's digitized, right, when you're, you could be measuring to the optical photons to 5,000 or 10,000, part in 5,000, 10,000, if it was perfectly that way, but it's not. There's lots of problems that are involved, okay. So the perfect diamagnetism, is the, the called the Meissner effect and so forth. There's a bunch of formulas for it. I won't go on it because I'm behind now. Um, but we know this because you've seen this experiment. At least I used to do this experiment when I was teaching this, uh, the electromagnetism. And there is this maglev vehicle. And uh, there's also one now f to the Shanghai airport where the train is magnetically levitated by the, by the Meissner effect. Okay. 
But this is also an issue uh, that if you have the superconducting strip, it has to have a surface screening current in it. And then it, it's, it creates a magnetic field, it gets kind of canceled magnetic field in the middle, it creates a little bit of magnetic field on the outside. That also means that M kids are more sensitive to magnetic fields than we initially thought. Because as you make the surface and everything spread out, so that we now actually have to put magnetic shields around our M kid detectors because the Earth's field is significant enough to, uh, and feels around the lab. And, you know, there is a, uh, a um, I forget what it's called, London depth, I think it's the London depth or something like that, that there's a certain range in which the fields stick in. And so you have to be careful about that. And depending on how you build your strip and so forth, the, 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 the diamagnetism can become a major part of the inductance or the, or the Cooper pair, since you know, changing into, they can become the dominant one. Okay, so there are also macroscopic quantum effects. That is, you know, it's this huge 10 to the minus 15 Tesla square meters, um, but it's integrated, and so it, it shows up in things, uh, and a lot of things, including the justice junction. Um, but magnetic vortices are also quantized. That is, if you weren't careful about how you cool down your M kids array, you were going to end up with some some uh, vortexes uh, put in there, and you you'll, you have to watch for those. So those are the kind of things that you have to be careful about. So so let me get back to the M kids. Okay. So what you want to do if you have long wavelengths is you want to use micro lenses or feed hole arrays to reduce the inductor volume, so you can keep the inductor small. So here's where you want to absorb. So you want to put your antenna or your lens to focus on this part. This is the capacitance, and then you have an array set out like that. And, and uh, so that's, the, that's the, the, the kind of thing. For the, for the lumped element, these are lumped element M kids. There are other kinds that are done, right? So you, you either go have the, have the photons go through the antennas or the lens, or you have them go into absorber and conduct it to the, connect the energy to the, to, <coughs> to the M kit element. Okay, so in general, I borrowed this slide from the, I think it's the Schrank guys, the microwave connecting devices are the best choice for, you know, for your detector when you need a lot of pixels, that is more than 5,000 pixels, then you, you, it's hard to beat it because you still can do it with one cable, right? And it's, it's just that kind of thing. And this means up until this time period, which was you know, three years ago, something like that, you, you, you definitely want them in the, in the optical down into the infrared. And from 500 to 2,000 microns, right, two millimeters, you're, it's a choice between the, 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 the bolometers, the TES bolometers and, and the MKIDs. <coughs> The, the measure sensitivity <coughs> now is comparable to TES's in the wavelength range <coughs> where lots of effort has been spent. And there's a number of instruments based on MKIPS now that are taking data and publishing papers. Those are, those are some, of the, some of the ones. And I'll give you a couple of examples before we run completely out of time, yeah, which we did. All right, so here's the point about the frequency demand multiplexing, and here you can see you not only have to worry about getting these guys all evenly spaced, which is done, but you have to worry about overall, you know, shape to the response of your whole circuit. That is, you, when you have a whole array, the circuit also has a response, and it makes a wavy, wavy kind of a background, right? So, in this case, they've nicely done it so that each pixel has a unique resonant frequency, and they're nicely spaced. Then they can simply generate a comb of sine waves and 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 send it through the device and you can read out thousands of, uh, uh, of detectors. Now go back to this thing that I was mentioning about the detector, you know, how detectors went. Back in the early days, in the, in the late 70s through the 1990, we were improving the detectors and having very small arrays because the detectors were getting better each time we went to fly or take data. But once we started getting close to the quantum limit, then you started having to build bigger detectors. In order to stay on the on the you know the Moore's law, the sizes of the detectors have been increasing, and 
what you can see on this side, this is the, where the MKIDs started showing up and uh, how they, they, they you know, went from a simple set to finally the ones that, you know, Nika 0 up until Nika 2 and so forth. You can see how they've been improving compared to what has been basically the bolometers, uh, a bolometer rays uh, and, and so forth. And I have one more picture of that just to show it in a different color that you, and that with the MKIDs not called out separately, you can see we're staying on this curve where the next sort of step is you're going to be, you know, heading to tens to hundreds of thousands of array, you know, pixels in your array, not whatever. That becomes much harder for bolometers because the, just assembling it and putting it together is difficult. But if you look at the CMBS4, that's still the baseline, is to make, you know, upwards of 500,000 bolometers and put them together. We'll see. Okay, so the goal in the microwave, in the millimeter wave, is basically you have some kind of a feed horn, you some kind, and you have your absorber and your inductor together, and you have, in this case, the back short, so they, you adjusted it to make the quarter wave back short. And here you just have structure in order to make it, uh, make it form. Uh, or you have another kind of thing. There are some detectors that have two MKIDs and you have a detector in the middle and you're seeing how the data, you know, you can partly interpolate the data and so forth. But you then have to think about how do I make big arrays of feed horns and match them onto the, de the, the MKIDs detector, right? So here's a MKID detector, here's the feed horn coming into it and then, then you've made a huge array of feed horns by stacking all this metal stuff together. Here's another example where you see it's designed for there to be a 300 micron wide area for the absorber, which is the inductor, and coming around it. And then this goes to the capacitor, and that's coupled directly to the feed line. And that's how you read it out. So here's another example. Here is a really simple, it's a single layer M kit. You, it's printed circuit is very straightforward. You have the antenna of these two U shape these two pieces like that, or the antenna and the inductor coupled to it, you have a lens that you put on the top of that, and that a lens is part of a whole array. This is, it looks like bubble wrap foam, but, but more sort of spread out. And then it goes through this system, and then there's a, the line and there's the coupler uh, in order to bring it together. So you, you build the capacitance and inductance the same way. And here's an example of how this has how the beam pattern shows up using those lens, ar lens arrays, right? Now, these lines are on every 3 dB, so the, the, you see the 3 dB line in here, another 6 dB, 9 dB, and so forth. So it's not perfect, but it's okay, right? And uh, I'm running out of time. You can also use these in different kinds of interferometers, uh, including the, the Fabry Perot, and you have to s separate the shell orders because you can measure the energy some level. You can choose which order you're operating in and so forth. This is one which is for a ter terahertz interferometer. All right, so I wanted to talk about optical ones because this is a large part of the effort we were pushing. So there are a number of optical M kids projects going on. Most of them are uh, in collaboration with the University of Santa Barbara group. There's Archons, which has taken data in Keck, and it's two kilopixels. There's Darkness, and I'll show you. Uh, it has uh, 10,000 pixels, and MEC, which is a, an art resolving power 10 IFU for Subaru, which is a little over 20,000 pixels. And there are future instruments that are, that are made. So here's the 10,000, I'll show you in more detail, the 10,000 pixel, a close up of it, and even a closer up part of what the, what the array looks like. And, and you can see, so already they have been able to figure out how to reduce the manufacturing errors to where the yield is extremely high. And also, so they can read out 10,000 in, in a relatively simple, straightforward way. So here are the darkness and MEC detectors. The, the uh, uh, you know, there's, there's the versions of them. Here is three laser beams uh, sent in on them, and you can see the resolution. These were at five, well, basically six, and a little over six nanometers, and eight nanometers. And you can see the resolution is terrible, right? That was one of the big failures. That was the problem. 
is that they should have had an R of 10, but they have an R that's more like six or something like that. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of hard to say. But that guy is 10,000 pixels, and this guy is 20,440 pixels. And they all seem to be working, well, most of them seem to be working fairly well. And uh, so you can kind of expect that they will go on and make some improvements. And here was an example of, uh, you know, of getting a resolution of 16, that is, you know, better than 6% resolution uh, from this particular detector that's done. And you can see the time response when the photon comes in and then the decay time because you have to, the decay time is set by how you build the MKIDs to how quickly <coughs> the quasi-particles turn back into Cooper pairs. And that's part of the choices you make in, in, in what's going on. Okay, and here's a picture from them. The, the upper left corner is what we, re we believe represents the truth because we believe Hubble. <laughs> so it's a very interesting set of uh, objects which have, have interacted with each other and, ha and, and Hamilton R picked this out as one of the things that contradicted our usual uh, cosmology. And it's, uh, this is the, you know, this is the pixel, you can see the pixels from, from archons that it was done on the 200 inch telescope. So it's not only proof that you can do it, but it's proof you can go out and take pictures. And you, unfortunately, the, the energy resolution isn't as good as it is. You should be able to get the colors back reasonably well. But, it's, but in the future, they should be doing quite a lot better. So I had a comment on that. And then I think I have one, two more slides after that. OK, so the ultimate resolving power is the Nefano factor. So before we understood quantum mechanics or, <laughs> or thing like that, we used to have this thing called the Fano factor, which told you why the distribution was narrower than Gaussian or narrower than actually Poisson, because Poisson looks Gaussian when you go far enough out. And so now we know that you can actually make things where they're narrower. So in silicon, the energy gap is around one EV. An optical, optical photon just makes a few quasi particles, right? And so forth. And the superconductor, it's, it's, uh, it's around three ten thousandths of an electron volt. So the ratio there is around 3,000. So an optical photon generates hundreds to thousands of quasi particles. Like I say, a typical optical photon will make like 5,000. How well can you measure the energy? Well, it should be n over root n. You should be able to get to 1,000 because of the, what's going on. If you're a little less naive, you should be able to get to 200, right? Uh, say, but right now, today, people can get a resolution of 16. Eventually, given the kind of circuits and stuff that people have, you should be able to get to 50. My calculation is you should be able to get to 100. Uh, but you have to have, be careful about the materials and, and also have lower temperatures in order to, to, get, to, to get to the, where you have the resolution of 100. When you get to resolution 100, your galaxy surveys means you're really just doing the survey when you look with these devices, and then you may follow up on some interesting guys with a spectroscopy in order to, to, to see what particular kind of events and so forth they are. So this is, this is the, the, for, the forward-looking approach, if you can get these cameras working, to doing galaxy surveys. If you want to do with 100 million galaxies, this is the kind of way you want to do it. Okay, now people, people have been working on turning these into X-ray detectors too because up until now, it's just too hard and difficult for them to use the, the uh, microbolometers, the micro uh, calorimeters, and uh, you know they can get the energy resolution. So, so far, the photon energy resolution for x-rays is not bad, and you're looking at different materials because they have different transition temperatures and they have different absorbing materials because for x-rays, you're looking for a different kind of absorber. And so there is, there is a, you know, the, the possibility of doing that. And you also want the absorption to happen in a reasonable you know, thickness in order to, to make things go. So one of the things they've been trying uh, for the optical is platinum silicide. And that actually might end up working for x-rays too. So let me end this, because we're late for the coffee break. So the MKIDs are up and coming technology. They're, they're, they're going to be important for quantum effects and for larger arrays. Right? So right now, the competition is that 
there's a whole community that knows how to use bolometers. There's not such a big community that knows how to use MKIDS yet. But the MKIDS have application across many fields, not, not just a limit, more limited area. So I'll stop at this point so that we can have a <laughs> coffee break.